Yo, what is up, everybody? It's your boy Soda here with the Autumn Windbags. Back with another one. You may notice, no RJ. RJ, he moved into a new house, forgot to pay his bill. Forgot to pay his light bill, forgot to pay his water bill, his trash bill, and most importantly, his cable bill, because his internet is not working. That's why he can't join us to record. That's why it's me, your boy here, to serve you. You're welcome. Now, because of that, RJ was nice enough to put a rundown for me. So we're going to take a look at some of these topics. And uh, yeah, we'll just go for the Have a good time. We're just going to have fun. Have fun. Just play around. Uh, if you haven't uh, already, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. You know, and all that other stuff, right? Tell your friends, say hey, tell your mamas, tell everybody about the auto win bags, where the shit. Also, I did a couple of breakdowns on some of the quarterbacks, uh, the top 40 quarterbacks in the draft class coming up. I know it may be a little bit far-fetched for us to be able to get, get one of those guys, but I may do some on some of the other guys as well, not just the top three guys. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, let's, and speaking of quarterback, so there's a lot of stuff going around right now. Right now it's a lying season. Anytime you get close to any type of free agency, any type of uh, draft style stock or um, combine, anything like that. Everyone's just, they're just, everyone's lying, right? But there are certain truths out there that just can't be ignored. One truth that can't be ignored is the Russell Wilson experiment in Denver was terrible. Didn't work out. Didn't work out for, for Russell. Didn't work out for the Broncos. Didn't work out for like Paul Hackett. It didn't work out for anybody. Okay. And uh Sean Payton goes in there, sees okay, what's going to happen? Uh, what, what can I get out of Russell Wilson? And for his credit and Russell Wilson's credit, he did play much better last season than he did the season before. 26 touchdowns, I think I believe it was eight interceptions. I think it's like a top five touchdown to interception ratio in the league when he was playing. So not didn't have a bad season. But there's the other stuff, too. So Jeremy Fowler in ESPN, Jeremy Fowler said that uh, the Raiders would be the best fit for Russell Wilson. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but you can't ignore the fact that Russell Wilson definitely is somebody that would be on the radar of a lot of teams out there. Um, there's quite a few teams out there. There's, you know, Tampa Bay, who seems to be pretty locked in with Baker, but there's them. There's Minnesota, who knows, who knows what's going to happen with Kirk Cousins. Uh, a lot of the, the draft and needy teams who are looking to draft uh, a bunch of players. Who knows, man? It's it's up in the air right now, and, and, and the main reason for that is, is this is the big shoe to drop right now, the Russell shoe. So here's the thing. If you're a team out there and you strike out and you don't get – Kirk Cousins in free agency. You don't get Baker Mayfield in free agency. Russell Wilson as a stopgap, let's say, for example, you're the Falcons, okay? And you trade up in the draft. You're able to trade up and get one of the quarterbacks that you really like. Why not bring in Russell Wilson to compete and play a year for really cheap because he's getting paid by never no matter what. So you pay Russell – really cheap, you're able to have him in the building, you're able to steady the ship and have the rookie tune up and get and, and learn underneath. And then next year when you can let Russell go and maybe he becomes something really good, maybe he just he shows that he can't play anymore, who knows. But for right now, he's not a bad third option after Cousins and after Baker. If you're looking, if you're in this scenario, it just so happens the Raiders are in this scenario. So Jeremy Fowler said that um, to said this about the Raiders and Russell Wilson. He said, this is honestly a good fit. The Raiders will explore ways to trade up for a quarterback in the draft. Coach Antonio Pierce has an affinity for Jaden Daniels from their Arizona State days. But moving up from 13 into the top three is an arduous task. The Raiders have not been linked to the Cousins or Mayfield free agencies. It is perhaps notable that Wilson listed Las Vegas 
as one of his four preferred destinations amid talk of a trade from Seattle in 2021. He would relish the chance to play with Devontae Adams, too. Well, honestly, who wouldn't? So that's a big draw, right? Uh, and, and it does make a lot of sense when you when you stay, take a step back and you look at what you're getting with well, the last time he played, what did he look like, what it's going to cost you. So this is what uh, Jeremy Fowler, Fowler had to say on Get Up about Russell Wilson signing with the team uh, for next season. Highly motivated. He's willing to help his new team in a big way. If that means taking the minimum, then that probably has to happen. I, I don't know how the team's probably going to want to pay him a little bit right. out of respect, honestly. But I talked to somebody close to Wilson. They said not only is he highly motivated, but he's trying to go to a team that can win and has the infrastructure to win. Denver hadn't been winning before he got there. He right. went somewhere that knows how to get it done year after year to put himself in the best position. So there it is. Like you said, it's it's not a it's not a uh, an expensive. Let, let's say Russell signs up. We we sign Russell Wilson for whatever reason, right? We say, look, we're gonna we're gonna get Russell as the vet, like RJ says. We got the vet, we got AOC as the incumbent, and then we draft a rookie. Okay, so now we we just let let basically let AOC and the rook and and uh, and Russell go at it to see who's gonna start. And if the rookie ends up shining a little bit later, we put him in. If not, he could sit a year, and we can go ahead and just groom him to be the player that he can. Because ultimately, you don't want to put in a player too early. You saw what happened with Bryce Young. You saw what happened with Anthony Richardson. They just can't protect. If, if they don't understand protection, they don't understand blitzes, they don't understand that stuff, they're not going to be able to protect themselves. And you're just wasting a pick by getting them hurt. Uh, so in this case, you have to ask yourself, why is Russell Wilson on the market again? Why is Russell Wilson getting released why does another team not want him and booger mcfarland on on that same episode of get up has had this to say about that russell's year one in denver was a disaster and we all know why year two he got better there was confident quarterback play but i think it's, it's very alarming and very telling that even though it was better sean payton has said i don't want him now is russell wilson a borderline hall of fame quarterback based on what he did in seattle Absolutely. But are we saying that Russell Wilson is going to have the same success that Manning and Brady had in the second part of their career? I haven't seen it. And I hear you with the uh, touchdown to interception ratio. But that TD to interception ratio was so good. It was so good that Sean Payton said, we will pay $90 million to get you the hell up out of here. So I don't want to hear about <laughs> stats and all that stuff when it comes to Russell Wilson. Is Russell Wilson a bona fide starting quarterback to the point that Sean Payton and the Denver Broncos, they said we will pay $90 million to get you out of here. That speaks volumes, man. Booger not mincing any words, man. He just went straight forward. He said, look, this is it. Like, if, if he is so good, if Russell Wilson is so good, if Russell Wilson is an answer out there for you, if Russell Wilson is somebody that you want on your team and he can help you win, if he's a top five, touchdown to interception ratio why did why did sean payton say i will give this dude 90 million dollars to go away and you have to ask yourself why is that because i'll tell you something right now seattle was more than happy to move on from russell wilson more than happy to move on from russell wilson I, the organization the coaching staff his teammates they were more than happy to move on from him denver seems to be a lot of the same the coaching staff, the organization, and his teammates seem to be more than happy to move on from Russell Wilson. So you have to ask yourself, do you want to bring that into your locker room? AP just got the locker room. He just got the job, right? He's he's the 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 team's believing in him and the team, you know, thinks that they can win with him. Do you want to bring that type of energy in? Because ultimately, it wasn't like Russell Wilson didn't know what was going on in Seattle and he was just oblivious to what was going on and what people were saying and how he was being perceived even after his first year in Denver for him to go into again the next season at in Denver and to rub a new coaching staff the same way he just seems to be a little bit unaware of himself and what he is and what how he comes across so do you think he's going to change now dude's 35 years old man he is he's he's who he's going to be and and Another point to that is AP was able to get the locker room 
for one big reason at the top. There's a lot of them, but one at the top was, and 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 Max Crosby said this, he allowed you to be yourself. As long as that's you, who you are, be you, be true to yourself. And um, that's how he was able to win the locker room. Don't try to be someone else. We're not doing the Patriot way. We're not doing this way. We're not doing that way. We're doing it the Raider way, right? Well, what's the big knock on Russell Wilson? He's in disingenuous. He's kind of aloof. He's off to by himself. Uh, he's passive aggressive, like stuff like that, where he did, he doesn't get along well with teammates and coaches sometimes. Like this stuff, like I was telling RJ a few weeks ago, what was so impressive about AP and how he was able to get the locker room so quickly. And it's it's hard to get a group of 70 some odd players to go into the same direction. It's a lot of different players, a lot of different people, a lot of different personalities, a lot of different experiences. To, but to be able to galvanize that group of a, a large group of people and coaching staff and organization to go in one direction, it's not easy. You can't fool that many people for that long. He was the coach for what, nine weeks? He you can't fool that many people for that long a time. If Russell goes in there, I, I the only way I see this happening, even scratching the surface, okay, is if there is a long talk between Russell Wilson and the coaching staff headed by Antonio Pierce. Tom Schlesko will, will be in there as well, but it's going to be AP doing the talking. And he's going to say, look, man, Here's what we're going to offer you. We're not going to give you the veteran minimum, like Jeremy Fowler said, just to, to be disrespectful. To be respectful, we'll give you five million bucks, okay? Which is still chump change for a, court, a starting quarterback, right? Or a potential starting quarterback. But here's what I need from you. You're not a brand. You're not an organization. You're not an entity. You're a football player. Who we need to come in here, become part of this team, and do what we ask of you to help us win games. If that's be a good teammate, if that's be a good backup, if that's helping the the uh, starter study better, identify defenses better, just be a good leader, be a good role model as far as a player goes. We need you to do that. We don't need this other stuff. We heard about the other stuff. And honestly, we don't care. Because honestly, the Raiders, they've, they've done that before. Check Jim Plunkett. What happened to him? He got drafted really high. I think it was like the first pick of the draft by New England. Bombed out. Went to San Francisco. Bombed out. He, he washed out in two different spots. Sound familiar? Goes in to the Raiders. Was a backup. They didn't play right away. Finally got a chance to start. Won a couple Super Bowls. I'm not saying that Russell Wilson is going to do that. But what I'm saying is this is a part of reclamation projects have been a part of the Raider way. The Lyle Alzados, the John Matuzaks, Those guys, John Matuzak and Lyle Alzado, they played for the Broncos and they played for the Chiefs before. They played for us. So reclamation projects aren't anything new for the Raiders, right? Jack Jones. Gets released, comes over, and he's our best DB. So I'm not a, I'm, I'm, I'm not opposed to it, but there needs to be a hard line drawn. And I think with a leadership group like Max Crosby and Devontae Adams, especially now Max is being more vocal. Like I said, I wanted him to be more vocal a couple of years ago. This is gonna this couldn't be a, a thing that can work, but there's gonna be some friction. There's going to be some people getting rubbed the wrong way. And like I said, after, after 35 years, it's going to be hard to change the man. If Russell Wilson starts acting a little sideways, he is going to get confronted to his face. Not a coach, not a, a guy in the front office. It's going to be a player getting in his face and checking him. And that's what needs to happen because he needs to understand this is not the Russell Wilson show. This is the Raiders, and the Raiders are always going to and forever going to be bigger than Russell Wilson. So if he wants to be a part of this legacy, fine, jump on board. But it's not going to be on his terms. It's going to be on whoever's running the Raiders' terms. 
And right now, the heartbeat of the Raiders is AP and those players. So am I am I against it? I'm not totally against it. I just don't think it'll work because, honestly, we saw what happened with Josh McDaniels. Josh, Josh McDaniels comes in from New England, and he's been told over and over again for a decade, these are the things, that, these are the ways you screwed up. He's been telling other people, I identify these different reasons and these different ways of how I screwed up. Play, ex-players has been going on podcasts and shows saying how bad he is and how this and how that. He didn't change one bit. He didn't change at all. The issues that people had with him before are the same issues that people had with him with us. And at some point, you just have to face facts that people don't normally change. Maybe different parts of their personality become more prominent, but they are who they're going to be. And people who are seem to be a little bit maybe, like I said, unaware of themselves, like a Josh McDaniels doing the same thing twice in a row with two different franchises, right? And Russell Wilson doing the same thing twice in a row with two different franchises. It's it's a tough – I think it's a tough call. It's a, it's a tough ask for someone to go up to a grown man and say, hey, you need to be completely different here. Now, it's not like a Jack Jones thing where he made a lot of, like, silly mistakes when he was younger – and things that we're able to get cleared up. But genuinely, he's a good guy. But he's just, he just needs a little bit of extra love, right? That's different than a guy who has shown to be maybe a little disingenuous with his teammates, who has uh, been maybe a little bit self-serving in, 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 in some cases, who has maybe a little bit more stubborn in how he wants things to run offensively. He wants to be a little bit more of a playmaker, off-the-cuff type of guy and doesn't want to really play within an offense. I don't know if that's going to work out. If, if, if he can get on board with something that we're doing here and be a part of the solution, I can see it being a fit for maybe a year, maybe two. I don't see it too much after that. Uh, but for right now, it's just a big rumor, but it's, it's getting a lot of smoke. And, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. So we'll see how that works out. Again, I'm not totally against it. I just don't know if it's going to work out because I don't know how much Russell Wilson can change who he is and how he comes across to his teammates, coaches, and the organization. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the draft coming up. There's a lot of mock drafts out there. There's a, a ton of them. I'm, I'm sure you guys have probably gone on like PFF or, or, or there's a bunch of them. There's a, like a mock draft database and, and a, a pro football talk. They have one too, or pro football news, excuse me. They have one where you can just go there and you can just do all these crazy trades. What's going to take me for me to get up to number three? Wow, who knows? But the Athletic did a, um, a mock draft, and um, the Raiders are looking to trade up, man. The Raiders are looking to trade up the boards. Uh, it was the big talk in um, Indianapolis at the Combine that teams were talking about how teams that were ahead of the Raiders in the draft order we're kind of just talking freely about, yeah, man, they talked to us about what it's going to take to move up. Of course, you don't do anything now. You want to wait until – why, why would you trade up with uh, the Giants at five if quarterbacks go one, two, three, and four? You know, you could probably wait it at 13 and got the same guy, right? So they're going to wait and see how the draft plays out, which is kind of what RJ was saying, right? But for right now, that's the big talk right now in the NFL is the Raiders are being aggressive and moving up. Uh, the draft is, you know, it's, it's coming quick, man. It's, it's, it's a, a month and a half away. You know, it's like six weeks away now, I think. And, uh, Raiders have been exploring, you know, trading up in the first round. And according to a lot of, a lot of teams and a lot of league sources, um, they could move up for any position basically, right. To, to get any player, they could move up and get the guy they want. But honestly, it really wouldn't make sense to move up you know, from 13 to a primo spot for anything other than a quarterback. So if they do move up, it's going to be for a quarterback. RJ talked about it last week. He said, J.J. McCarthy is going to be the tipping point, right? Watch out when he goes. Because if he goes early, some other quarterbacks can go right after and we can have six quarterbacks gone in the first 15 picks, right? There's some talk that J.J. McCarthy may be slotted maybe a little bit higher than let's say Jaden Daniel. 
Jaden Daniels. Uh, if that's the case, and let's say, for example, it's Caleb, Drake, and JJ go one, two, three, that's a hard call to the Cardinals and saying, what do you want for us to move up to four and get our guy? I know RJ really isn't super keen on that idea. He would rather sit back and, you know, see how things develop. I'm of the opinion that that is the development. New England probably is not going to trade out of three. Washington is probably not going to trade out of two. So the Cardinals are good at quarterback. As co- according to them, you can agree or disagree, and that's not your call. But according to the Cardinals, they're cool at quarterback. They, they, don't, they don't need to draft another quarterback. So that's a primo spot for them to be able to get some more picks, build that roster, and for someone to jump up and get a quarterback. So there's a couple of different ways to look at this. And I think first, like I talked about expectations, right? What's your expectation? Anything that's been accomplished in life starts off with your expectation. What's your expectation going in? What are you looking to accomplish, right? With expectations, you have to ask yourself, what is your goal here? What is our goal with the Raiders? So that's what AP, Telesco, Mark Davis, all those guys are asking themselves, what is our goal here? Is our goal to win a championship or is our goal just to win some games, right? And if you're aiming high, you have to shoot high. And RJ, uh, I wanted to have a conversation with RJ about this. Like, I think it would have been a really fun convo because he's, you know, he was a history major in college. He likes history. I like history. I love like old true crime stuff like that. I love listening to that stuff, watching the, the documentaries and stuff like that. I was, I'm listening to a book called The Five Families. It's about the rise in organized crime um, in, in America and also uh, the, the lawyers, lawmakers, legislators, uh, how they combat organized crime. And I look at it from this perspective, and this is how it ties in. There's the RICO Act. So it's it's the racketeer-influenced uh, corrupt organizations, right, RICO. Basically, it's organizations that thrive off of illegal activity. Now, what the RICO Act is, it's a way. it was a way for um, lawmakers and legislators to bring top-level people in organizations to trial and indict them on the actions of their organization. Not They didn't have to do it personally, but as long as they knew about it, authorized it, or profited from it, they could be tried as well as an organization. So they're trying the group together as an organization, not individually. So at the time that the RICO Act was enacted, okay, the FBI was going after these low-level like nothings, right? Like got pimps, guys are running brothels, uh, you know, loan sharks, guys are doing gambling, you know, stuff like that, bookies. Like they're, they're, they're arresting these guys and they're convicting them. But then, I mean, what is it doing to the organization as a whole, right? It's not really doing anything to get these low-level guys off the street because they're, the, the, the higher-ups are still in control. They're still moving the the – the puppets around, they're still making the money, they're still making the calls, they're still getting people killed and all that stuff, right? So what the FBI was into doing really wasn't doing much of a dent for the organized crime or, you know, syndicate, right? So what's your, what's your goal? And, and and that's what a lot, of the, a lot of the newer FBI agents coming in was like, well, what's our goal here? Is our goal to, like, just rack up a bunch of arrests and rack up a bunch of convictions? even though they don't really mean anything, even though it doesn't lead to anything, is that what we want? Is that what we want? Just so we can boost our numbers up and we can tell Congress, hey, look, this is what your money's getting you. We're, you're, we're getting convictions, we're getting arrests, we're getting indictments on these low-level guys. But is that what you want? Is that your goal? Or is your goal to go after the big fish in these organizations and bring those organizations down? What is your goal? What is our goal? Is our goal just to win a bunch of games and maybe make the playoffs every now and then? If that's our goal, let's just stick with AOC, right? And not worry about moving up to get a quarterback. We'll just wait for whatever, whoever falls to us, I'm sure he's fine. 
or we just get one in the second round, whatever, no big deal. Even though it may not be the guy that I want, it may not be the guy that I'm comfortable with, but whatever. I don't want to trade too much to get the, this guy because, you know, it's, 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 not a, it's not a sure thing, right? There's another reason why. So the first reason why the FBI didn't want to use the RICO Act initially was because it would hurt their numbers. They like their numbers. They go after the low-level guys. They're easy, easy slam dunk convictions, and their conviction rate is really high. Their numbers look really good. Another reason why the FBI didn't like want to use the RICO Act is because it took a lot of time, it was really expensive, and it wasn't a sure thing. So bear with me. At the time, you can get, it was like a, 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 a Section 3, right? It was basically like a free use of um, electronic monitoring, okay? So as long as you can prove to a judge that if you put a bug in this nightclub or this uh, gentleman's club or this bar, if you put a bug in that establishment, you're going to get some stuff to get some indictments, right, that you can use. But the problem is, is it's expensive because you have to have round, round the clock monitoring of that bug. So you need probably what, three teams of two working eight hour shifts. So eight, eight, eight is 24 hours, right? And it's 30 days. You only get 30 days. So you have to maximize those, those hours in those 30 days. So that's a lot of time, a lot of man hours, and it doesn't guarantee that you're going to find anything, right? But guess what? If you do, you're going to topple the big guys, not these little low-level guys. You're going to topple the big guys. Or or you can use that information to get place more bugs. Hey, look, Judge, we got this information from that bug. We can place more bugs here and here and here, and we can get even more information. Like that's doubling down again. And then doubling down on what you already have to get more information, to make sure everything sticks, to get more people from different organizations maybe, but or even go for the tippy top guys. Is it more expensive? Yes. Is the, is the success rate lower? Yes. But that's the goal. The goal is to topple these organizations down. The goal is not to get the lower level guys off the streets. It's to get the big fish off the streets. That's the goal. So what is your goal as a team? What do you want to do? Do you just want to win games? Or do you want to be seen as a Super Bowl contender, perennial Super Bowl contender year by year by year? Because if that's the case, you do what you have to do to get the guy that you feel is going to be the one to get you there. That's what you do. So is is, is our goal to, to be able to go for another quarterback. And to, okay, I want to get a quarterback, but I want to make sure that I can go after one in two years. I don't, I don't want to do that if I, if I have to give up too much and it's going to be another three years till I can go again for another quarterback. Is your goal to make sure you have enough capital to go for another quarterback in two years? No, because you're planning to fail now. Now, I'm not saying that you can't plan for contingencies or plan B, but ultimately what you're doing right now, what you do in this draft as the Raiders, what we do here, is going to show all of us fans what their mentality is. Because I'll tell you something right now. Devontae Adams is still an elite player in the NFL. He's not getting any younger. Max Crosby, you saw what, what he put his body through. Okay? Now, I don't wish anything bad on anyone or Max Crosby, but all those snaps he plays, how he plays, all those surgeries he has to have, man, you have to, you, you have to tell yourself, how long is he going to be able to play at this elite level? He has a few more years left at least, but you, you don't want to waste these years throwing out these mid freaking quarterbacks. You want to go out there and, and if you fail, at least you tried, right? You want to go out and you want to date all these fours, fives, and sixes just because they're easier to freaking date and you know they're going to say yes? Or do you want to freaking ask out the eights, nines, and tens? Because maybe, you know, it's a, it's a lower rate because, you know, they're pursued a lot more, a lot heavier by a lot more people, right? But you know what? If it works, it even the reward is there. But you don't get that reward if you don't go for it. You got to go for it in order to get it. And, and that's the issue that I have with the whole lay back and see what happens strategy. And it's easy to say that. It's easy to say just sit back and don't trade too much and this and that. It's easy to say that when it's not your job. 
Because if you don't, if you just sit there and you spin your wheels, you're not going to be around that much longer anyway. You might as well go out on your principle off of your work that you and your organization and your scouts that, that are doing. It's better off. To, for me, I would rather do that. They just sit back and be like, well, you know, I just got to be a value and I don't want to like give up too much because if I give up too much, then, you know, I can't try again for a few years. Ultimately, what does it matter if you win two games or you win eight games or even nine games or even 10 games? Like the year we made the playoffs. Great. We made the playoffs, but we were not any, we weren't any threat to win the Super Bowl that year. I understand that people are like, oh, well, anything can happen. Look at the Giants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but the reason why it's so special is because it doesn't happen often. Who were the two of the, the, the teams in the Super Bowl this year? They were they were division winners. They were teams that won like 12 games, whatever. Like, you know, they're not slap teams, you know. So you have to, you have to ask yourself, who do you want to be? Because ultimately, if you win, if we win the next three years, if we're playing it more conservative and we win – eight games, nine games, nine games the next three years, or we win, or we, we go for one of these young quarterbacks and we whiff, and we win four games, four games, five games. What is the difference? We're still not contenders to win a Super Bowl, and that's the goal. The goal isn't to be good. The goal is to be the best, and that's what you have to ask yourself. Like I said in the beginning of this whole thing, what's your expectation? Do you want to go out there and you want to just win and win a couple of games here and there and be like, oh man, we almost got there. Oh, only one team can win. You know, a third 31 teams are going to be bummed at the end of the year. You want to have that mentality? Or if you want to be like, damn, man, we almost had it. But we're going to try again next year and we're going to do the, everything we can to, to, to put the best team out there with our guys, with the best guys, no matter what it takes. That's the mentality we need. And I just don't like the mentality of just sitting back and letting things fall to you. Like, you, if you feel like, and then, and then here's the big if, okay? Because there's, you know, if you if you guys have looked at my videos that I made, there's a a, a, a positives and and there's some areas for opportunity in each one of these top three guys. And and the areas of opportunity are glaring. There's not like they're little things. Like they're pretty big things. Like can they get fixed? Of course they can. But they're still pretty big things, right? So these guys aren't slam dunks. A lot of times when a quarterback go, a young quarterback goes to a situation and they don't succeed, it's not solely the quarterback's fault that the quarterback can't play or this and that. It's a, a, a lot of the stuff surrounding the quarterback, his coaching staff, his players, his, you know, organization. Like how, how is the infrastructure of the team? If you feel you have the right infrastructure, if you feel you've scouted the players on your team, the players available in free agency, the players that are available in this year's draft, in next year's draft, and you feel confident that player A is the guy that's going to get you to where you need to go and you're willing to bet your, your job on it, go get it. Go do it. And if you don't, if you don't get it, at least you tried. At least you, you picked up the phone and, and, and you ruffled a couple of feathers. And you, and you shook a couple of trees and see see what fruit fell down. Don't just sit back and be like, oh, you know, whatever happens here. You know, if he comes to see, if he was available at seven, I, I'll trade to seven, but I'm not going to trade up to. What does it matter? Ultimately, if you get the quarterback for the future, what does it matter? Another an extra first round pick. What does it matter? It doesn't matter. It doesn't. I get what you're saying. And I get what people say when they're like, well, we can't give up too much. If the guy ends up being your guy, you can't give up enough to get him because he's that valuable. And unfortunately, in the AFC, people want to talk about, well, it's only a 50-50 proposition, right? Only 50% of the, team, the, the the quarterbacks that are drafting the first, it's slightly above 50%, but let's just say 50-50 for sake of argument. Only 50% of these quarterbacks end up panning out, right? Well, if you don't have a first round quarterback in the AFC, you have a less than 10% chance of making the playoffs. That's just making the playoffs. That's not being a title contender. That's just making the playoffs if you don't have a first round quarterback. So if you're going to get a first round quarterback anyway, you might as well get the one you want, not just the one that's there, is what I'm trying to say. 
different things, different ways people look at it, at it. We talked a little bit about the draft. We talked a little bit about draft strategy and trading up. We talked about the RICO Act. Very informative show today. I'm telling you right now, RJ missed a good show today, buddy. So talking about building a winner and building a team, one of the best ways that you can improve your chances of winning your division is not only by getting better, but if you can get better while simultaneously making a rival in your in your division weaker, even better. So uh, James Palmer uh, was on um, – was at the NFL report. And uh, Mike Garofalo had something very interesting to say about who, where he thought Chris Jones was going to land uh, in free agency. Take a listen. Yeah, well, uh, multiple teams in the AFC West need help okay. in the defensive line. I'm just saying, the, the, game, the place where he played his last game as a chief, maybe his first game as somebody, I don't know. Just, I'm just saying, I don't know. Who knows? And it could be that the team is, is, is okay. traveling Vegas, to Vegas baby. for week one. Maybe that's what I'm saying. I don't know. Oh. I haven't seen an advanced schedule. I have no idea. I'm just trying to find a way to not allude to the fact that it's the Raiders I'm talking about. Yeah, man. He was laying on pretty thick there. It, it, it seems to me that I don't, I don't know that Chris Jones was, is liked getting played with the way he was. And I understand from a front office perspective what you're looking to do. But bear with me here, okay? We just got some money back from our boy Jimmy G when he pissed hot, pissed laser beams, and, 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 and got popped, right? So we got that extra money in the bank, right? And let's say, for example, we do go out and we do uh, sign Russell Wilson for four, $5 million, whatever. And then we draft a rookie quarterback. We're probably going to be spending less than $10 million. We're, we will be. At, at, at those numbers, we'll be spending less than $10 million on the entire quarterback room. That's a big opportunity to strengthen a part of your defense that needs help. We need some help on the defensive line interior. So there's two ways of thought on this. You have cap, we have cap space, right? We have capital to move around in the draft, okay? We have a strength. Now, after AP took over, we were the best defense in the league, right? It's it, that's statistically, we were the best, like the best points per game allowed in the league after AP took over those last nine games. So he's got something. Him and Patrick Graham, they got something going on over there on defense. Two schools of thought. The defense is really good. Let's just give them give them a cup, plug a couple of holes with some role players or some you know mid, middle guys, whatever. Okay, and uh, they're good. we know they're going to be good because they were already good. The same guys were already good. Let's plug a couple of holes, right, and improve them a little bit. But let's use this cap space to get a quarterback to do this to, to strengthen our offensive line, whatever. That's one school of thought. Second school of thought is. Why be good when we can be great? Why settle for being the best in the league and go for being one of the best ever? What's so wrong with that? What's so wrong with strengthening a strength? Because you can never have too good of a defense, okay? That's like having, oh, we, we, we just have too many, you know, too many, uh, too many guys that can sack the quarterback on our team. You know, it's just, it's just uh, we just have too many of them. Or we have too many cover corners. You know, we got too many corners. We got too many lockdown corners. I don't know what to do. It's not a problem to have, okay? It's not a problem at all. Spending that money to bring in Chris Jones, I think it'll be worth it. I think Max Crosby would be freaking pumped to have that. Imagine that. You got Koontz and 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 uh, Max on the outside. And let's say you got Wilson and Jones on the inside. Damn. Damn. Those are some mean dudes in there. And guess what? That secondary... Gonna look pretty tits if you have a front four like that. So it's a school of thought is you you keep you make your strength even stronger when a stronger strength is better. It's like it, it, there's sometimes a stronger strength, right? It doesn't really help you that much, right? 
like if you have a good starting quarterback and you sign up, you sign like a really, really good backup quarterback, he doesn't play. You know, you, well, what is he going to do to help you? Maybe if the first guy gets hurt, right? But, you know, you have to plan for it, but you don't expect it. Defensively, if you get a player like, you know, Chris Jones's uh, capabilities on this defense, man, it's something that would can put a team into title contention right away. When you have a defense that's that good and you just have maybe even a competent offense, look at – we're going to roll this back around to Russell Wilson, okay? When he was at his best, he had, you know – that really good defense and a sound running game. He had a couple of guys on the outside that can catch the ball too. Sound familiar? It can happen. It can happen. And then after the year, we let Russell go. Hopefully, you know, either either AOC is ready to come back or one of the rookie quarter quarterbacks that we take, if we take one in this draft, is ready to play at the time, and we let him go. And we go ahead and, and we move forward with the same bomb-ass defense with Hall of Famers up and down the freaking defensive line. Imagine that. Imagine that, taking freaking players from a, our a rival to play for us. Imagine It's our turn now. It's our turn because I'll tell you what, we did take Matuzak. We did take Lala Zato, right? We did do that. But then guess what? The Chiefs took Marcus Allen. They won a lot of games with Marcus. So it's our turn to bring it back, to take it back, right? Definitely. You know, Max playing over in, in with the Chargers now. Okay, it's our turn now. It's hard to take take from from a, a team and make them weaker, and by uh, at the same time making it stronger. I think it'd be a great move. All right, guys, it's time for what up win back. It's going to be abbreviated show today. Usually, there's a little back and forth between RJ and myself, but unfortunately, it's just me. Fortunate for you, but unfortunately for the show and length, it's just me. I can't argue with myself. I tried, and I always lose. All right, Jeffrey YW one T E. Jeffrey White, Jeffrey Y. White, I don't know, whatever. Uh, I love how Soto was all happy and jovial talking about RJ's haircut and then hookers. Then his mood came through like a pit bull talking about Lombardi. Wondering if Soto is going to do any more second look videos. Interesting. Uh, RJ actually picked these what up windbags. Um, yes, I want to do more second look videos, but with a little bit of a twist. I want to make them shorter. I want to talk about um, if, a, if a Raider had a big game or they had a poor game, I want to show why and how they had that poor of a game or a good of a game uh, instead of just you know recapping the entire freaking game, which you guys know what happened. I want to go a little bit in depth and, and talk about some different things. So this, there will be some more videos coming up. And also I want to start doing some videos on my other channel that I'm going to start building, and that's going to be just across the NFL. Uh, not just the Raider stuff. I love the Raiders. I'm always going to be a Raider. Uh, but, you know, I like NFL too. I'm just doing a couple things here and there just to kind of like talk about other teams and stuff like that. Uh, it just kind of makes it fun. All right. Uh, Tano Raider 16 says, once a Raider, always a Raider, should not pertain to Michael Lombardi. Agree or disagree? I agree. I agree simply because the front office is – inherently not a loyal position right we we see it night right now with champ kelly was you know with the broncos with the bears right and and telesco used to be with the chargers so it's not like these guys don't feel like you can't expect to be like the fact that telesco was um the gm for like 11 12 years or something like that with the chargers that's like crazy it doesn't happen very often where you get a gm that's there for that long so these guys know they're going to move around a lot, right? Like if you're a, an assistant GM and you want to get promoted to a GM, you normally don't go get promoted within the same team. You interview with another team and get that job, right? And that's normally how it happens in the NFL is you get drafted by a team, you're, you're a backup or a special teams guy, then you become a backup, then you become the starter, and now you're a starter, right? Like you can progress within that system. But I don't think it applies to Michael Lombardi. I'm, uh, I really don't. I think that um, – he feels that the the Raiders are evolving into something that is not exactly what he had when he was there. And ultimately, it needed to evolve because the Raider way, after 
towards the end of his career with us and after he left wasn't working at all and hasn't been for quite some time so it needed to change we need a little bit of a in, in, influx of, of, of a little bit of juice a little bit of energy a little bit of swag we didn't have that for a long time and i think now we have it and i think that because he feels michael lombardi feels like it's not exactly the same as the raider way that he saw it it's not the raider way well if you wear the emblem, if you're getting paid by the team, if you're going out there and putting it all on the field and putting the hours in, yeah, it kind of is the Raider way. All right, guys, thank you very much. That's my time today. Appreciate it. Make sure everyone to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, engage in these videos, man. Talk to us. We, we, we love, I love, personally, I love talking to you guys, whether we're, we're talking shit or we're, you know, whatever, just talking football. But, yeah, um, like, comment, and subscribe, guys. We're, we're – heading it towards 9,000 subscribers, which is great. It's all for you guys. All we do is for you. And hopefully next week, RJ's got his internet. He paid his internet bill and he's able to come and, and join us uh, for another installment of the autumn windbags. All right, guys, until then, peace.